power pact and crucially important. Um, the issue of immigration. Today's show, we're going to talk about a little bit of immigration from a substantive, philosophical, practical point of view. And then we're going to talk about the S-storm that's been going on out there, um, which is the nature of modern politics. We have basically a, a very weak crop of politicians who are intentionally managing the decline of America. That's what's taking place. We have a Democrat party that isn't interested in fundamentally transforming America as they are interested in fundamentally destroying America. And they're doing a hell of a job. And this has been the progressive effort uh, for a century, and it's, it's incredibly successful. Look at the various aspects of our culture and society. Is there an institution in this society that hasn't been or isn't being devoured by the progressive left? I can't think of one. Football, our school system, media, obviously Hollywood, you name it. And uh, those of us who understand what's taking place, who believe in individual liberty, who believe in the rule of law, who believe in a constitutional republic, who believe in a nation state with borders, who believe in having a military second to none, who believe you back up the local cops. We're in a minority, I believe. We're in a minority, but that's just the way it is. So let's focus on immigration for a moment. I have played on the radio, those of you who listen on, uh, to my radio show, several times we found an audio of former Governor Dick Lamb, Democrat liberal of Colorado from over a decade ago. And he was at an event, and what he said, I thought, having read it first, and then we dug and dug and dug and found it, was exceptional. Exceptional for its courage and exceptional for its prescience. And it's very, very important what he's saying, because he's right. And he's not the only one to have said it. So we're going to take a few minutes. I hope you'll really listen to this. Bring the kids around the TV and check this out, too. Uh, this is from several years ago, former Governor Richard Lamb, liberal Democrat of Colorado. Go. I would like to share with you my plan to destroy America. If you think, and some do, that America is too smug, too rich, too self-satisfied, not diverse enough, too white bread, I have this plan. Toynbee, you know, said that all great nations rise and they all fall. And he said, and the autopsy of history is all great nations commit suicide. So here's my plan, eight parts. Number one, I'd make it a bilingual, bicultural country. History shows us that no bilingual, bicultural country lives at peace with itself. There's not one, I believe, that doesn't exist with an incredible amount of tension they, that, and, and conflict, if not civil war. My second part of my plan would be to invent something called multiculturalism. This would be two parts. Number one, I would say that all cultures are created equal. It would be, make no difference and make it impossible to talk about such things as culture. And the second one is that I would really try very hard to make people continue their cultural identity. I would replace the melting pot with the salad bowl. My third part of my plan would be to make the fastest growing demographic group in that country the least educated. I would add a second underclass to the first underclass, unassimilated, undereducated, antagonistic, and then I'd have 50% of them drop out of school, not graduate from high school. The fourth part of my plan would be to get the big foundations to fund, and big business, to fund these efforts with lots of money. I would invest in ethnic identity, and uh, victimology. I would get them to think about their lack of success was only the fault of the majority. I would start a grievance industry. The fifth part of my plan is I would develop dual citizenship. I would promise people actually divided loyalties, allow them to allow both for, to vote for both Vincente Fox and George Bush. The sixth part, and this is important, I would place all of these subjects off limits. I would make it taboo to talk about, actually, or criticize this whole thing. I would make it uh, come up with a word like heretic used to be 200 years ago. Let's say we call it racist. And I would try to accuse anybody of this that would object to my ideas. 
My seventh part then, I would make it impossible to enforce our immigration laws. I would develop a mantra, let's call it this, that uh, because immigration has been good in the past for America, it will continue to be uh, good in the future. My eighth and last part, and it's important, is I would censor this book. This <laughs> man is dangerous. He's on to my plan. Don't read this book. Well, the plan's in place. That's obvious. That's what's taking place in this country. You know, a gentleman who used to live next door to me was a wonderful gentleman. He passed away a little less than a year and a half ago, and I do miss him. His name is Bill. And when I would walk my dog, Barney, out there, and he'd be walking his dog, we would bump into each other, and we would chat about things. And he... He gave me this book. He said, I want you to read this book. He, he lent it to me. And uh, I finished reading it. It was very, very important. It's not very long, you can see. And I knocked on his door to give it back to him. He said, no, actually, I want you to keep it. And he passed away shortly thereafter. And he's just a wonderful man. The Disuniting of America, Reflections on a Multicultural Society by Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr. Does that name ring a bell with anybody? Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., the son of Arthur M. Schlesinger. His father was a noted historian, I believe from Harvard, and Jr., no question, was also a noted historian from Harvard. And he was a top advisor to Adlai Stevenson, but even more to John Kennedy. Ever hear the book Profiles and Courage? Well, one of the people involved in writing that book was Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr. Not the only one, but one of them. And so he, his liberal credentials are unassailable, or were. He's passed away as well. And I want to read you something from this book that my neighbor gave to me on the disuniting of America. Press too far, the cult of ethnicity has had bad consequences, too. The new ethnic gospel rejects the unifying vision of individuals from all nations melded into a new race. Its underlying philosophy is that America is not a nation of individuals at all, but a nation of groups. That ethnicity is the defining experience for most Americans. That ethnic ties are permanent and indelible. And that division into ethnic communities establishes the basic structure of American society and the basic meaning of American history. Implicit in this philosophy is the classification of all Americans according to ethnic and racial criteria. But while the ethnic interpretation of American history, like the economic interpretation, is valid and illuminating up to a point, it is, a, it is fatally misleading and wrong, then, when uh, pre presented as the whole picture. The ethnic interpretation, moreover, reverses the historic theory of America as one people, the theory that has thus far managed to keep American society whole. Instead of a transformative nation with an identity all its own, America in this new light is seen as preservative of diverse alien identities. Instead of a nation composed of individuals making their own unhampered choices, America increasingly sees itself as composed of groups, more or less irre irreducible in their ethnic character. The multi-ethnic dogma abandons historic purposes, replacing assimilation by fragmentation, integration by separatism. It belittles unum and glorifies pluribus. The historic idea of a unifying American identity is now in peril in many arenas, in our politics, our voluntary organizations, our churches, our language. And in no arena is the rejection of an overriding national identity more crucial than our system of education. The schools and colleges of the Republic train the citizens of the future. Our public schools in particular have been the great instrument of assimilation and the great means of forming an American identity. What students are taught in schools affects the way they will thereafter see and treat other Americans, the way they will thereafter conceive the purposes of the Republic. The debate about the curriculum is a debate about what it means to be an American. The militants of, eth of ethnicity now contend that a main objective of public education should be the protection, strengthening, celebration, 
and perpetuation of ethnic origins and identities. Separatism, however, nourishes prejudices, magnifies differences, and stirs antagonisms. The consequent increase in ethnic and racial conflict lies behind the hullabaloo over multiculturalism and political correctness, over the inequities of the Eurocentric curriculum, he has quotes around these words, and over the notion that history and literature should be taught not as intellectual disciplines, but as therapies whose function is to raise minority self-esteem. Watching ethnic conflict tear one nation after another apart, one cannot look with complacency at proposals to divide the United States into distinct and immutable ethnic and racial communities, each taught to cherish its own apartness from the rest. One wonders, will the center hold, or will the melting pot give way to the Tower of Babel? I don't want to sound apocalyptic about these developments. Education is always in ferment, and a good thing too. Schools and colleges have always been battlegrounds for debates over beliefs, philosophies, and values. The situation in our universities, I am confident, will soon right itself once the great silent majority of professors cry enough and challenge what they know to be a voguish nonsense. Of course, that's not going to happen. And he writes, and I will conclude with this part, the impact of ethnic and racial pressures on our public schools is more troubling. The bonds of national cohesion are sufficiently fragile already. Public education should aim to strengthen those bonds, not to weaken them. If separatist tendencies go on unchecked, the result can only be the fragmentation, resegregation, and tribalization of American life. This was written several decades ago. I wonder what he would think of Black Lives Matter, or CARE, or what I call all these ethnic front groups that have as their purpose what he talks about, to balkanize and thereby eviscerate what is supposed to be a common American culture. And you're not even allowed to talk about that today. So another brilliant professor. You really can't categorize Samuel Huntington, the late Samuel Huntington as well, as liberal, conservative, or whatever. But he wrote a book called Who Are We? The Challenges to America's National Identity. This, at the time, really caused a stir, particularly at his university, Harvard, but in other places too. And a, an absolutely brilliant man. And I'll just read a short passage from his book as well. And I do this not only to expose you to these authors in these books, but so you know, we're not alone in this thinking. This used to be the thinking of, uh, of the American elite just a few decades ago. It used to be the thinking of the population. So what you see on CNN and MSNBC and you hear Dick Durbin and Gutierrez and all that, these are really, really radical and destructive views that they're voicing. And yelling, if you notice. They yell more and more and more. Now, Huntington, inciting two other men, he writes, to what does one assimilate in modern America? We talk about assimilation as Americanization. He does. So what are you assimilating to? You notice the title of this book, Mind, Rediscovering Americanism. There's a reason that I gave it that title, and the tyranny of progressivism because we need to rediscover Americanism to know what we stand for, because it's not being taught, let alone taught to people who come here from other countries. In 1900, the answer was clear. Assimilation meant Americanization. In 2000, he writes, the answers were complicated, contradictory, and ambiguous. Many elite Americans were no longer confident of the virtue of their main, mainstream culture and instead preached a doctrine of diversity and the equal validity of all cultures in America. You hear this right now, Republican, Democrat media. Immigrants do not enter a society that assumes an undifferentiated monolithic American culture, wrote Mary Waters in 1994, but rather a consciously pluralistic society in which a variety of subcultures and racial and ethnic identities coexist. So to the extent that America has become multicultural, immigrants may choose among the subcultures they encounter or choose to maintain their original culture. They may assimilate into American culture without assimilating the core American culture. Assimilation and Americanization are no longer identical. So in other words, people can come into the country 
maybe watch TV, the same TV shows, buy iPhones, uh, maybe get an entitlement, get wealth or whatever. That's sort of assimilation. He's saying that's not assimilating into the American culture. The massive influx of immigrants before World War I led, as we have seen, to immense efforts to Americanize them by governments, business, and charitable organizations. The late 20th century immigration was genera uh, wave generated nothing comparable. Only Congresswoman Barbara Jordan, who I've talked about before, just a, a huge loss to this country, and the Commission on Immigration Reform she chaired back in about 1990, made a prominent argument for an immigrant policy to promote Americanization. And the Commission's modest 1997 recommendations were largely ignored. The prevailing atmosphere was entirely different from what it had been at the beginning of the century. First, debates over immigration focused almost entirely on its economic costs and benefits and its fiscal impact on our government. The consequences of immigration without assimilation for American social cohesion and cultural integrity, which were central to earlier discussions, well, were now largely ignored. Second, it often was implicitly assumed that assimilation would occur more or less automatically. Immigrants will become Americans simply because they are in America. Hence, no need exists for major efforts explicitly to promote Americanization. Third, has been the belief that Americanization is undesirable. This is a new phenomenon in America intellectual and political history. A rat quote, a radical program of Americanization would really be un-American. One prominent political theorist, Michael Walzer, has argued, America is no longer singular national destiny. Americanism, another scholar observed, has connotations of racism, sexism, class domination, religious intolerance, and ethnic purity. Today, the sociologist Dennis Wrong concluded in 1989, nobody advocates Americanizing new immigrants as in the bad old ethnocentric past. Almost no political leader, apart from Barbara Jordan at the time, urged programs for the Americanization of America's newest immigrants. And that's what's taking place in this country.